Hi, this is Derek Jordan. Thanks for joining us today for this show about the health concerns surrounding 4G and 5G technology. You may recognize me as the host of the World Fusion Show, but this show is not a music show. Rather, it concerns health and safety. And I am also a member of NDCAP, the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel. I've been serving on that panel for four years, and we are have been charged with investigating and reporting on all the issues around the decommissioning of Vermont Yankee. But this show is not about that kind of radiation. We're today going to talk about non-ionizing radiation. I'm joined today by two wonderful experts in the field, C.C. Doucette and Annette Smith. And we are, I uh, just want to say, Annette is a the director of Vermonters for a Clean Environment. And um, she's been done many things working on behalf of the public. She was also awarded the title of Vermonter of the Year by the Burlington Free Press in 2017. Cece Doucette is a uh, technology and education director at um, wirelesseducation.org, and it's been a tireless advocate for all things EMF in the Boston area. I want to say welcome to our guests today, Cece Doucette and Annette Smith. Thank, Thank you sir. for joining us. It's great. So um, I'd like to just start by um, defining some of our terms because there's a, a bunch of acronyms as normal. Um, so first of all, what is 4G and 5G? So 4G and 5G are parts of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum that have been licensed and are about to be licensed for 5G, where that's what's carrying our signals back and forth with our cell phones. And right now, the industry has pretty much used all of the good spectrum with 3G and 4G, and those used to be longer wavelengths. And G stands for what? Generation. Right. Thank you. So mm -hmm. right now we're on the fourth generation mm -hmm. and the industry is spinning us up to get into the fifth generation. Mm -hmm. But what's left of the spectrum are these tiny little millimeter waves that can't go very far, mm -hmm. nor can they go through buildings like 3G and 4G do. Uh, even trees can block them, right? Yeah, I mean, or a leaf. Yeah. So it's not like we're going to just get rid of 3G and 4G and then have 5G. 5G can't work without the others, so right. we're going to densify and add a lot more infrastructure for 5G. So we're piggybacking on 4G and 3G. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, okay, so what about EMFs, RF, yeah. electrosmog, which yeah, is yeah. a term I love. What, what about that? How would you define that for us? So RF stands for radio frequency. Mm -hmm. And, for example, if anybody who's listening today has an iPhone, if you take it out and go into settings, remember the acronym GAL, like this GAL on this program taught us how to find this. From settings, you go into general, and then up at the top, you hit about, and then all the way down, you hit legal. And at the bottom of legal is RF exposure. That's the legal fine print that the industry has had in there forever. And that RF exposure is radio frequency microwave radiation that the industry politely calls energy. And in our very own personal devices, it tells us to keep these things off our bodies or else you may exceed the FCC limits for public radiation exposure. So what's the distance that they ask you or that you think is safe? Or there safer? is no safe level of microwave yeah. radiation identified in the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. And so the FCC back in the 90s set a limit, you know, way up here. And we now have literally thousands of studies all over the world showing biological harm way down here. Yeah, yeah. So just because the FCC has a guideline, not even a standard, that does not mean it's safe. That's right. It was never safety tested before any of this wireless technology came to market. Human guinea pigs, once again. I and our think. standards are much, much higher than in other countries, like That's Russia true. or Italy. They yeah. have much, yeah. much lower standards. So they're allowed, you're saying the higher standards mean we're allowed more exposure mm -hmm. with our phones, etc. And it's cumulative when you have Wi-Fi in your house and you have your cell phone and you keep adding on to it. And then you think about adding these 5G antenna on every utility pole and that there have to be tens of thousands of them, mm -hmm. uh, and not just towers, but 
actually on the I hear the, the 5G poles. towers need to be every 1,500 feet in right. order to be effective in a population center. Yeah, and the way the industry is spinning that up is they're saying you're going to have faster speeds, you're going to oh, yeah. have you know great downloads, you can get a movie in two seconds or something. But some good news on that front, just this week, Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut has been calling out the industry. Back in December, uh, one of the new FCC commissioners is Brendan Carr, and he made a public statement saying, oh, 5G is safe. Oh, yeah. And he's now been called out to say, please prove the evidence mm. based right. on this statement. Good. And they haven't been able to come up with anything. They're doing this. They're saying, well, the FDA says this, yeah, and you know. <laughs> and so I am so grateful, because this is the first time, I think, in our history that publicly the industry has been called out by a member of Congress to say, we should not be bringing this to market if it has not been safety tested. Who was Attorney General of Connecticut for 20 years, yeah. too. Yeah. So and someone with real credibility. And it's it's, um, it's almost a miracle, but yeah. it's long overdue. Well, there are those who have been educating him for years and have been mm -hmm. working very hard behind the scenes. Blake Levitt did a press conference mm -hmm. with him, and she has been a tireless advocate for public health She's down in great. Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah. So EMF, what's EMF? Electromagnetic field. So when you have electrical signals and magnetic signals that come like this. Back in the old days when we just had radio uh, and TV signals, our bodies can acclimate to that pretty well because it comes along on this nice rolling continuous sine wave. So unless you happen to be right under the broadcast tower and you're getting a walloping dose, we can deal with that pretty well. What we did with digital technology is we added another wave on top of that but it's a square spiked pulsed erratic wave and it's doing this at our system billions mm. of cycles per second. And that is what the science is showing is physiologically harming our systems at the non-thermal level. And that's right. critical that's because key. the industry got this technology to market saying, oh, you have to have heat before you can have harm. And by the way, <laughs> when they were testing these, they didn't put the cell phone right up against your head the way that we all know we do. People use it today. Mm. They put a spacer in there, and then they put a probe inside a mannequin's head who, we'll call him Sam. He's a specific anthropomorphic mannequin, 90th percentile of military fitness, like six foot two, 220 pounds, which yeah. doesn't resemble pretty much any of us. Not kids, you may be, sure. but, <laughs> <laughs> but there was no testing on children. There's right. no testing on fetuses, the yeah. elderly, or people with an existing health condition. Right. And we literally have thousands of studies all over the world showing great biological harm at the non-thermal level. Yeah. And in fact, in 2000, uh, T-Mobile, the parent company in Germany of our T-Mobile here, got the scientists together and said, please let us know what we should know about wireless radiation and health. And they did a full study and we never saw it, yeah. right? And they continued to push this out. The telecom industry commissioned their own study back in the 90s when the first woman died of a brain tumor and her oncologist got on Larry King Live and they said these were unusual tumors on the side of her head, yeah. not normally where a brain tumor would enter the brain. And they happened to line up with her cell phone and that became a PR nightmare. So the industry stepped up, said, let us do the research. We have the funds. They did the research, took several years, 200 scientists. And the head of that was Dr. George Carlo. He came back and said, pretty much, it probably was that cell phone. And children are more vulnerable. Yeah. Rather than protecting the public, what did the industry do? They got the Telecom Act. Mm. And in that, they say, you can't claim any kind of environmental harm. And this was the FCC uh, ruling, right? Mm -hmm. Back in... 96. Six. Yeah. 1996. Yeah. Right? So their testing was for heat from one device in a half an hour. We have nothing for what we are submerged in today. You think about our children and our right. classrooms. The industry has pushed that 21st century classroom at the state level. And now when you talk about this topic to your school committee members, they look at you like deer in the headlights. Yeah. And that was very puzzling until we figured out if you go and look on the Department of Education websites, our schools are being accountable for rolling out all this te toxic technology into our schools. And we wonder, you talk to any teacher today, ask them how many tissue boxes they're going through for all the nosebleeds mm. these kids are getting. Talk to the school nurse about headaches, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, nausea, 
brain fog, inability to concentrate. concentrate yeah. We know scientifically that this microwave radiation, constant exposure, can do that. Yeah, but you're not talking about 5G. Well, that's uh, right. Uh, 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 right. We're, we're still at 3G yeah. and 4G. But we have to understand there is no safe level yeah. of microwave radiation. And so now what the industry is doing, because they want to keep forcing us down this path of wireless, is they're putting these things outside our neighborhoods. I was just asked to speak in Cambridge, Massachusetts to their Poll and Conduit Commission last week. And there were neighbors sitting right in there where the industry's already started putting in these small cell antennas. Mm. And the way the industry has set this up with their own laws is if you let one permit through from one vendor, you have to let every single vendor in. So you could wind up with dozens of these antennas pulsing right outside your home, yeah. literally yeah. at street level, not 300 feet in an industrial park. That's right. But small cell antennas for 5G and 4G. They're right on your out, telephone pole. Or right there, wherever. right outside where you're trying to so sleep. So what we're really talking about is, back to this term, electrosmog, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that we're in this, this sea of EMFs yeah. at this point. Um, now, what about cell phones, iPads, you know, um, laptops? What about the frequencies that we're getting from them? So we've been taught all Wi-Fi all the time. We've bought into this whole convenience, and there are some great applications for this. In a controlled medical situation, you can use radio frequency radiation to stimulate stem cell growth or bone cell growth. Mm -hmm. But in this ubiquitous way that we're now, as you said, drenched from our own devices, let alone what the industry's putting outside our homes, our bodies can't catch a break. And we know there are several ways that this biologically impacts us. First, in the wee hours of darkness, as part of our circadian rhythm, we are supposed to have melatonin released from the brain. It goes in and regulates our sleep cycle, yeah. and it helps to escort the toxins from regular cell re repair and regeneration, helps to escort those out of our bodies. Now, our brain cannot decipher between natural daylight and this constant pulse of this light energy form that's microwave radiation. So now we've impaired our body's ability to release the melatonin to be the clean up mechanism and to help us sleep properly. Yeah. So that's one effect we know. We also know it can cause things in our blood to clump together, to magnetize and create this Rolo effect. So now you've got your blood cells glomming together and they can't go and freely oxygenate mm -hmm. where they need to be going throughout our bodies, right? Um, a third thing, and Dr. Martin Paul speaks a lot about this, is the voltage-gated calcium channel. So mm. I'm not a scientist, but I figured out how to say this in a way that I yeah. think most of us okay, can grasp. Cool. So we have a cell wall on all of our cells. This constant pulse of microwave radiation breaks that cell wall, causes a leakage mm. that then creates this free radical called peroxynitrite. Mm -hmm. That is a really damaging free radical that then goes into where your weakest proclivity is. Maybe it's your heart, mm -hmm. maybe it's your brain, maybe it's your breast, maybe it's your testicles, whatever. But we know that this free radical peroxynitrite is looking to be the smoking gun. Yeah. And by the way, the food chemicals, glyphosate and so forth, mm -hmm. also produce peroxynitrite. Mm -hmm. So if you're not eating a clean organic diet, your poor body's already, you know, fighting things off and now you're laying this on top of it. So. Mm -hmm. We know scientifically, we now know the mechanisms of harm. And for many years, the industry said, well, there's no mechanism of harm. They yeah. can't say that anymore. No, we know. know. And our government has not been the best in the world about doing its own research. Yeah. But back in November, on November 1st, the U.S. National Toxicology Program, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, released a decades-long study that they had been doing, $30 million dollars, to go in expecting to prove that cell phones are safe. Mm -hmm. And instead, they found clear evidence of, of tumors in the Schwann cells of the heart. That's mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. They also found additional evidence of brain tumors and DNA damage, which we know is the roadmap to grow a proper human. Yeah. Ram the Ramazzini study in Italy also did a big finding in 2018 and their results corroborate ours and vice versa. So the industry can't say, oh, you need more science. That's right. We have the science. Yeah. What but we need Vermont, is public education. The Vermont Department of Health still has on its website mm -hmm. from 2012 that the only exposure is through uh, heating. 
Right. It's, st- it's just buying into the FCC. And it for is. Vermont's Department of Health to say that is, is very uh, disturbing. Yeah. It is, but they're looking at the higher authorities. They're looking at the CDC, and there's yeah. evidence that the CDC knew about this and then took information down. Likely they got pressured by the industry. But there's a great report that anybody can read for free. It's mm. called Captured Agency, mm-hmm. How the Federal Communications Commission is Dominated by the Industries It Presumably Regulates. Yeah. We also have indicators that other federal agencies are captured agencies, but Harvard put out this captured agency report. Anybody can go online and look up Harvard captured agency. Beautiful. And that was the missing piece for me because when I first learned about this, I was doing campaigns for my school district to get what we thought we needed for this 21st century classroom. And I'm like, you know, you do a cursory search as Wi-Fi. Okay. You will find studies saying we did these studies and there was no harm. I didn't know it at the time, but those were primarily industry funded, done under conditions, short term, that would show no harm. But no harm is never the same thing as safe. That's right. So I kept thinking, well, then I got to the real scientific studies, and the ones that actually got me on my feet were the sperm and the reproductive studies, because they've taken male human sperm, exposed it to a laptop with the antennas on, it changed the DNA, slowed the motility, and caused far fewer sperm to be viable yeah. in just four hours. Wow. Of exposure. The Vermont Telecommunications Plan that is currently up for adoption says 5G should come to rural Vermont and the Mm. state should take efforts to improve its reach into rural areas. And then it goes on to say that 5G small cell uh, networks should be encouraged through regulatory reforms. Such reforms should include an expedited process for permitting facilities on utility poles Mm. along travel corridors and that low orbiting satellites will bring new broadband to rural and wilderness Yeah, that's classic. Spaces. That was clearly written by the industry. Okay. We've seen something similar in Massachusetts where they write a bylaw so that you can adopt this ordinance and they're thinking, hey, we'll just give them this ordinance. Here it is, petition for rulemaking. That's it was it. filed in January and they've opened a, uh, a, a rulemaking just this week. So yeah. this this train has left the station in yeah. Vermont and we're, we're still trying to figure out where... It, where are the pressure points? Yeah. Where and we need to educate our legislators. We That's need right. to educate our our uh, Department of Health, mm-hmm. our Commissioner of of Public Service, the Public yeah. Utility Commission. We've got a long range transportation plan that talks about the growth of new technologies mm-hmm. such as autonomous vehicles and five G cellular mm-hmm. networks. That this also is up for comment. Yet nowhere in the actual document does it say five G. So there are all yeah. these pieces that are being put in place outside of public view that by the time, if we don't do something right now, right. by right. the time right. it gets to the point where people are aware, what are those things going up on the mm-hmm. utility poles it's outside my house? Mm-hmm. The, it's, it's not only is there nothing that we can do about it, but even now it's looking very challenging to figure out how to slow this down. Well, we are very lucky. There's some excellent resources today. Uh, Patty and Doug Wood run a group called Grassroots Environmental Education. She just won an award from the EPA because she's been trying to help protect our children and our communities for a long time. Mm. They have just recently put up a website called Americans for Responsible Technology. Mm -hmm. And if you are organizing groups, please reach out to them and get on their list because when they go into D.C., they can then represent you here in Vermont. Uh, They also have a website called Win19, Mm -hmm. like we're going to win this, but it's Wireless Information Network. People can get out there and network with one another there. So that's a really great resource. But the third one that they have is called Telecom Power Grab because this is a huge power grab by the telecom industry. It's all about the money. It is. It is. And nobody's looking at the health, but thank goodness for Senator Blumenthal and Congresswoman Eshoo. Congresswoman Eshoo has just put forth a federal bill to retain or restore local control in our communities to say if or where we even want this technology. Right now, they're trying to take away that local control mm-hmm. throughout the United States, and they're trying to lowball our communities because most of our towns have already negotiated um, appropriate rates for using public property to mount these antennas on, yeah. and now they want to come in and lowball us. Mm-hmm. So they write these ordinances and say, oh, here, we'll make this easy for you to, you know, the wave of the future and all this. Well, first of all, it's not safe. It's not secure with all this data going through the air. Yeah. 
physically it's not safe. We know how many telephone poles get hit by cars, and now you're going to have radio frequency meter mm -hmm. or emitters right there on the ground. And they're not small cells, as they would coin a phrase. These things might be this big on the pole, but they come with a refrigerator-sized you know, energy box that has to be used to make those things run. Yeah, the so, base of the pole or whatever, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and 5G is, is I think, uh, reasonably described as 4G on steroids. Mm -hmm. It is the frequency that the military uses for crowd control, it is. and it burns, burns skin. Right. Mm -hmm. And skin is our well, largest, largest organ. organ. Right? So, um, you know, this is a very scary technology mm -hmm. that is being proposed to be put on every, you know, in front of everybody's house, on every pole. Yeah. And so it's, you know, people who know Senator Leahy, who know Senator Sanders, mm -hmm. uh, we already have heard from Congressman Welch, disagree with you, we need to get this through. So the we need our senators to support Senator Blumenthal's work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, can I say something? Um, mm -hmm. Annette, I want to go back to the point you raised about this Vermont telecommunications plan. Mm -hmm. That is currently before the state house, and they've been. There was testimony on it last week. Um, we expect more testimony, but we don't know when this vote is going to happen. And it's in the Senate and Finance it Committee. Could be yeah. soon. Yeah, this vote. Mm -hmm. We are one of. This is really one of the main reasons that we wanted to do this show, mm -hmm. so we could get the word out to Vermonters, so that people, if they're concerned, could then contact their state reps mm -hmm. and express that concern. Yeah, they saying, can go to legislature.vermont.gov, look at who they know, who's on the Senate Finance Committee, which is the key committee, your uh, your area's Senator Becca Balin is mm -hmm. on it, and for people in other parts of the state, it, those are the, that's the key committee. Yes. But... Uh, any legislators, all legislators, need to get educated about mm -hmm. this. And we found that it's really best not to bombard people with emails, mm -hmm. but to, to, if you send them an email, follow up with a phone call. Mm -hmm. They are receptive to hearing from their constituents on Sundays and Mondays, and people who can do it need to go to the state house. Even over to the, go in person is go better. Go over the right? lunch hour, because nice the legislators, they, they say to us, uh, we get lobbyists all the time. We don't see average Vermonters, and we find they're very appreciative when yeah. people come in and sit down in casual time, not while they're in committees and things, mm -hmm. and talk over the issues of concern. Mm -hmm. Then if they're not on a key committee, they can talk to someone else. This is something that we've done on any number of health issues that are challenging, and the legislators really uh, do appreciate it when people take the time to actually go to the state house, uh, but you need to be very respectful of their time too. Yeah. I would like to change the topic slightly and just talk for a minute about smart meters. Mm -hmm. So, what can you tell us about smart meters, and you know the type of frequency they emit? Is that dangerous? Well, when I saw there was a lot of uproar going on in California and in Maine over smart meters, this was several years ago, maybe mm -hmm. 2012. Um, I saw trouble brewing, mm -hmm. and since I'm sort of in that area where I expect to hear from people, um, I had a staff person in the state house, and I said, "Just go to every committee where you see smart meters being discussed." And so he went in, and he said, "You know, and, and we did not take the health issue side of it at all. We find the health issues are very problematic often. Yeah. Uh, this issue is a little different because there is so much science up behind it. But um, we uh, made it about choice." People have a right to have a choice. And we negotiated an opt-out. It came with a fee. And then we worked with legislators further. And they made it so if you have a smart meter and you don't want it, you can call up your utility and say, I don't want it. Take it out. You and you were instrumental it. in this. It would happen in because Vermont. of because my of organization. Yeah. yeah, And because I saw it coming. So I've, I've been looking at this in a similar way. But that was with the utilities. That was Green Mountain Power at the time, Central Vermont Public Service. They they took the lead on mm -hmm. it, and they they wanted to work with us on it because they didn't believe that uh, a critical number would opt out to make it uh, a problem. But yeah. but getting that retroactive feature is really amazing because you get people who have uh, problems in their home; they're getting headaches. Mm -hmm. They finally figure out the smart meters mm -hmm. outside my bedroom. Right. Um, but in terms of the frequencies, these are pulsing, and they are pulsing probably more than the, than well, the utilities. We claim. just heard from a GMP spokesman that fifty every fifteen minutes every sorry every fifteen minutes, twenty four hours a day, these smart meters 
attached to people's homes, schools, mm-hmm. businesses emit these frequencies. It's a handshake, I guess, with the company, right? And then there are these gates keepers, I guess. Gatekeepers that collect the collect. data. And so if you have one of those outside your house, you're getting bombarded from all around. That's right. And we are we have a question about where people are reporting seeing these gray boxes go up on poles with lots of wires connected, and we don't really know what those are. So anybody yeah, yeah. watching this who has any information Please. about what they are, we're, we're still learning about are, what's being deployed right now. And we would like now. to ask our audience if they see these mysterious boxes that get are brand touch. new. Take a picture, mm-hmm. get the street address, and get in touch with us or some other organization so we can start to make a list of where these are going up mm-hmm. till we can find out what they really are because we don't know yet. Right. Hey, can I just take a moment to talk about solutions? Absolutely. So there's a policy group out of Washington, D.C. called the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy. They put out a free book called Reinventing Wires, The Future of Landlines and Networks. So as we're raising these issues with our towns, with our states, with the federal levels, we also need to guide them toward the solutions, and that is hardwired technology. The industry started out promising us and actually taxing us on our bills to bring hardwired technology to the premise, be it fiber optics or cable or, you know, our, our copper landlines. That is safe technology. Once you have it to the premise, you just hook up with an Ethernet cable and then you can hook up your phone. You can get something like a lightning to RJ45 Ethernet adapter hook that into an Ethernet cable, and then you can hook your iPhone to it. Mm. And then you can sit there and surf the web, text, whatever. Or your computer, right? And your your computer, your iPad, yep. If you have a MacBook, you need a Thunderbolt to gigabit Ethernet adapter. If you have something other than an Apple product, an Android, there are pluggable devices. You just need to make sure that your specific device has an operating system that supports it. So this is not insurmountable. Right. What we have to do, as you said, is get ahead of it now because the industry is moving fast. And all the legislators I've met with in Massachusetts, I always started with, um, help me to understand what you might know about the biological effects of today's wireless technology. And the answer was always, well, I really don't know much. So they don't, and it's not their fault because all they've heard from industry is economic boom. And I've had the privilege of meeting Frank Clegg, who's the retired president of Microsoft Canada. Mm -hmm. And he assures us the industry can absolutely do better. They can make it faster. They can make it safer. And whatever they make next is going to bring a whole nother economic boom. But it cannot be this untested wireless radiation. However, the dynamic in our state house in Vermont is we are so underserved and we absolutely have to build things out. And so exactly. the education part of how, for instance, 4G, uh, Vermont Public Radio, Vermont Edition did a program, mm-hmm. which people can find on Vermont Edition, that says that building out 5G isn't going to help with areas that aren't served by 4G. And so I posted a, in a, a couple of comments, I posted Senator Blumenthal's press conference, and then I posted a forum that you were part of and that CC was part of in Michigan uh, with all these fabulous speakers, in, cr- including Frank Clegg. And if people really want to dive further into this topic, they're divided up into five and 10 minute segments and it's yeah. incredibly mm-hmm. educational. Well, yeah. you guys have been tremendous. I want to wrap this up yeah. right now, but I want to say thank you so much, You're Cece welcome. Doucette and Annette Smith for joining us today for this show, just to start to introduce this topic right. to Vermonters. And maybe we'll get to do a second show at some point yeah. to go into even more depth because of course there's a lot more. Right. So, hey, I wanted to just say thank you so much for joining us today. This is Derek Jordan. I'm a member of EMF Safety for Vermont in Brattleboro. We're trying to help bring a lot of this information together and become a resource for people, um, you know, in terms of learning more about it. Um, Thanks so much. And hey, stay tuned. We're going to have more stuff. And uh, thank you so much.